Well, good evening, folks. Welcome to Paradise Valley Baptist Church. It's great to see you tonight, and a welcome to everybody who's joining us online, whether you are local or whether you are far away. Welcome to our Sunday evening service. We're going to begin by singing 482, Dwelling in Beulah Land. Once you find your hymn book, Majesty Hymn Book at home, if you happen to have a copy, 482, Dwelling in Beulah Land. Let's stand and sing together all three stanzas, 482. On the first. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is and I know the sins of earth be set upon every hand. Doubt and fear and things in vain, vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from your love. And I'm living on the mountain. Underneath the cloudless sky, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a mountain full supply, for I am dwelling in your land on the second. Let the stormy breezes blow, their cry cannot alarm me. I am safely sheltered here, protected by God's hand. Here the sun is always shining, here there's not an army. I am safe forever. In your land, I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. 482 on the third. You may hear the works of God in contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way he planned. Dwelling in the Spirit here, I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in your land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain. That never shall run dry. Oh, yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in your land. Wonderful singing, and I'm going to ask Brother Ralston, would you lead us in prayer this evening? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather with the church family. Feast on your words, Lord. It's such a privilege. So many in this world would love to have. Thank you for this place to meet. Thank you for our pastor that has a part to teach us, edify us, exhort us, rebuke us, reprove us. All those things that are so necessary to make us whole and make us fit for the Master Jesus. Lord, I pray you bless our time together. I pray you put your hand upon it and your protection around us as we, as we sit here and allow our minds for not to wonder what's being said or taught. And Father, I just want to thank you again for your loving kindness and your long suffering that you allows us to be here. So Lord, we do pray that you bless our time together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you didn't receive a bulletin this morning or if some of the announcements that I gave 
alluded to, let me uh, give them quickly again. For all of the men, I've updated the list that I would have given out yesterday at our men's meeting. The next one will be October the 24th. That's the Saturday directly in front of the revival meetings with Brother Ron DeGard and Austin Berge. They'll be with us Sunday through Wednesday the 28th, but this meeting is on Saturday the 24th. Um, so those of you that gave phone numbers and emails and said, hey, can you please update? I did my best to get it right. Take a look at it. I put copies on the back table. I don't know if all of them were snagged. Mike, would you be able to check just to see if, if uh, there are any that remain? I'll try to keep them printed and on hand. And then uh, as we need to add more names and info, please let me know. But use it as a prayer list for uh, the men of the church. Ladies, I know that you have your meetings, but as men, uh, we need to be praying that we would be what the Lord wants us to be, that we would take the leadership that God has called us to, and that we wouldn't uh, shirk that responsibility. Choir did start up again. We had a great practice uh, tonight, 515. If you are interested, uh, as a member of the church, if you'd like to serve in the area of the choir, please see me. Uh, for some, you might say, well, I'm kind of at that point of joining the church, we're talking about it, would I still be able to? Uh, just see me after the service. We can get that worked out. C practice, again, would be next Sunday, 515. So please join us uh, if that is an interest and you feel that the Lord may be able to use you in that ministry. Also wanted to mention, ladies, you have your meeting beginning on September the 29th, 630 here at the church. Um, of the 20 books that were ordered, 10 came in, so you can pick up a copy in the lobby. If you are of the 10 that the books are then depleted and gone, uh, my wife copied off chapter one and two from the reading. And this is from Claudia Barba. The book is Sovereign Hope, a study of the minor prophets. Uh, but you would at least have chapter one and two in time for the first meeting and be able to uh, be prepared for that. Uh, again, I mentioned the revival October the 25th is Sunday through Wednesday the 28th. Uh, mark on your calendar, invite folks to be a part of it, uh, neighbors, co-workers and friends and uh, get the word out. Our church is open and we are welcoming guests and, and visitors to join with us. So uh, take the initiative. It might be that you think, well, they would never come to church and then they express an interest. Uh, I'm encouraged by those that I have asked to come to church and even over a period of almost a decade uh, have never uh, wanted to respond, never taken that up. And then there is that glimmer of hope that, that they would like to. And uh, even recently, having had that occur, uh, it did my heart well to know that the Lord is doing a work, even at times when we think things have stagnated and they're they're going nowhere. So continue to have a uh, an outreach, encourage those that you live amongst, that you work amongst, and let them know that we're having these meetings. Uh, Brother Ron DeGarde as an evangelist. I know that you'll be encouraged by his Bible-based messages. You'll also be encouraged by his demeanor, his spirit, and his care for people uh, as has been stated of evangelists, sometimes they blow in, blow up, and blow out. He's not one of those individuals. And uh, if you were to bring a guest for the very first time that maybe had a bad experience years ago in a church and has never looked back, um, I wouldn't fear inviting them to these meetings, that they'll be able to hear the Word of God in a way that's um, compassionate and loving. So I hope that you'll join us for the meetings and mark that down. Um, we will be having nursery available and staffed as necessary. Um, if you've served in this capacity in the past and would be willing to, again, please touch base with my wife. She'll be putting together that listing. All right. So I have my phone on silence, but for my, my two daughters in college and potentially some other friends and family, they're watching, they're a part of the service. So what I'm going to encourage you to do as a church family as well for our own church family that are not with us. They might be home, they might be ill, weren't able to be out tonight. So when we kind of fellowship and, and walk around and talk, just come right on up, you know, a little parade, come on up and say hi. And uh, my daughters in particular were the ones who requested, they want to see you. So uh, this isn't me putting you up, but they want to see the family. So I did think about just taking the camera and turning it around and showing everybody, but that's not quite the same. So. Uh, if you'd like to, just if you're able to, come on up and say hi. And if not, that's fine. But uh, they wanted to be able to see the family. So I'm going to begin uh, with my own. Andrew, come on up. This is not scripted. So here we go, impromptu. Andrew, I want you to share something that is a praise and uh, whatever it is that comes to mind. We have not rehearsed this yet. No. no. So, you, so go ahead and let's think of a praise as we're on camera. People are watching you. 
<laughs> this is a little bit harder than when it was just us in the auditorium, right? Yeah, you look out, but don't fear their faces. It's, there's no, no need to fear them. You're amongst friendly folks, just like a big extended family. So, why don't you share a phrase? Because I've, I've stalled for 20 seconds. I'll give you time. So, go ahead. Um, for the welcoming church that you guys all are, and um, just for the safety that we have. Amen. Is there anybody that when you look out, you see that's not welcoming? Anybody? <laughs> anybody that right now, they just need to change that frown and turn it into a smile? No? All right. You can have a seat. Ethan, come on up. All right. Now you know how we're doing this. You think of a phrase. Trevor, you're next. Okay. Because your sister might be watching. I'm just saying. So if she's watching, she's going to want to see you. You've grown a lot. Just like Ethan's going on, too. <laughs> so, Ethan, go ahead. Give us give us a phrase. Uh, Hey, you know what? It'll still pick you up. Right here, right here. Give us a phrase. Go ahead. That we are able to meet again. That we are able to meet again. Absolutely. And we had choir tonight. That was exciting. And uh, Abraham, do you want to give a praise? Come on up, buddy. All right. This is this is praise time in front of the camera. It's amazing. You can forget your name. All right. You got your special watch on. All right. You want to? For the parents coming to our house. Oh, great. Yeah, you know what? Can I just say that uh, Mr. Cronin and Kenny and Trevor were a blessing yesterday. I had to get some wood. And Mr. Cronin, you know, we won't sing people's praises, but he was going to go do another job. And he had a trailer up to his truck. He didn't go to the other job because he decided to help me get wood with my family. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? So if you have a need, let him get a trailer. <laughs> and he'll put off. He'll put off his job that he was supposed to do, and he'll come help you do yours. That's what a good deacon does. I really feel bad. I'm like, you're not going to get to do your job. He was trying to get to the a nursery where you picked up mulch or gravel. Mulch. That didn't happen. He picked up firewood. So, <laughs> But that was, a, that was a blessing. Did you have fun playing with Trevor? Mm -hmm. Did you help with the wood? All right. Okay. All right, Ann. Come on up. Come on up here, Ann. Here. I was told tonight that Ian and I look a lot alike, but he's not. <laughs> Come on. I got my contacts. Well, don't worry about it. Then you don't see the people. They're not nervous. Put them on. Put them on. Put them on. They're reading glasses. You can't see. You can't see anybody. Can you? No, I can't. And do you have a phrase you'd like to share? Um, yes. For the beautiful weather that God has given us mm -hmm. and um, just how nice that has been. Amen. She would say hi to Evan Gunnar. Hi, Evan <laughs> All right. Where did Aaron escape you? Come on over here. I was told specifically I had to get my family up. They wanted to see it. Come on over. I realize folks don't like just seeing my face. And they had more fun when uh, we weren't able to meet. And they got to see their siblings and everyone else. So, Aaron, give us a praise. I'm really thankful for the book that we're able to go through. In teen class, it's been um, a big encouragement to me. It's really good to hear everyone else's thoughts. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Elizabeth, you're not escaping this. And then we're going to go to Trevor. Trej, as we call him. Okay. Do you have a phrase? I do. Yeah. Um, I'm thankful for God's grace. And um, as you preached this morning, that when he um, shows us what we're to do, he gives us the grace to do it and then lights our, our way to go further. And then he doesn't just expect us to um, try to get to a point you know, that's way beyond um, uh, where we're at, but he's gracious and loving right. to do that. I have to feel him. All right. So, Trevor, come on up. You got a phrase? You're going out. There's there's millions of people watching. Millions. <laughs> Go ahead. Give us a phrase. <laughs> that everyone was able to have a safe travel to church today. Amen. Thanks, Trevor. You look good. I like that shirt. <laughs> All right. Now, I think it's only fair that if they get to see the family, did I get everybody? For my family. All right. That, that I think we should get praises from that. So, Abigail and Emma and Michelle, you better be sending us praise. <laughs> and uh, girls, get your, get your cousin Lydia. Even if she's not watching, tell her she needs to give a praise to our church. She can send it to the phone. Caleb, if you're smart, you're going to send me a praise also. <laughs> so, if, you're not, if you're not watching, if you're not watching, uh, you better catch up. Maybe your mom or dad aren't watching. They can help you out. Somebody please tell that poor guy, send a praise. You've got my number. Okay. He, he does, and I've got his number. All right. So I expect my phone to be blowing up here in the next couple of minutes with uh, college student phrases. Right now, those that are at PCC, they have a pretty rigorous schedule. 
You could be praying for uh, Cheryl's brother, Tim Zacharias, for uh, Pastor Redlin, um, for the others as the church staff, multiple times each Sunday and throughout the, the week preaching. And, and right now they're under a pretty rigorous strain. Um, so be praying for them. So actually they're off tonight as far as a Sunday night service. So I think, I think Abigail wins first. Let's see here. Um, uh, well, it looks like Emma was first. So Emma, are you using Abigail's phone? She is so thankful that they can be a part of the service and still typing. So Abigail, you better respond here. We need, we need a praise. And tell Lydia she needs to give us a praise too. I want to hear from my niece. All right, but for those in the church, I wanted to open it up. It's Sunday night. Let's hear some praises, some things that you have. Linda, you guys speak good and loud. Most of the people tell me they can hear. They can hear what you're saying unless you're you're really, really faint, and then they can't pick it up. So good and loud, Linda. I want to praise the Lord for giving uh, the college students of Pensacola safety during that storm. Amen. I watched um, a video of the flooding, and it was really bad, like three feet of water. <laughs> Certain yeah. places. Yeah. So I'm thankful that the Lord just, you know, kept them safe. Absolutely. I know the Ralston son, Ian, he's also in Pensacola with the military and uh, he's doing well. He's safe. He's got power. He's got power now. He didn't have the luxury of the uh, college campus, so he was without power, whereas the students on campus didn't have any struggles. Um, Abigail gives a praise that they were safe during the hurricane, that they had a few days to catch up on some homework. Love you all, and I miss my church family, and we are watching. Um, anybody else? You have a crazy look here. Alan. I'm uh, thankful for a beautiful day, um, a beautiful sermon this morning. It really was a good sermon. And all the while in John 6 and 7 has been really good. And uh, just to be with family this afternoon and uh, being in church tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. And thank Alan and Linda. They've been helping with cleaning for the month of September. Did a great job with that. Anybody else? You have a uh, you have a praise you'd like to share? Dale. Getting back to normal. Praise the Lord for that. Yes, Diane. I'm thankful for the ladies' conference that we had at Valley View yesterday. It was really a blessing, and Amen. I enjoyed the speaker. And it was funny because even today, you actually hit on some of the topics that she spoke about. And I love when God does that. Yeah. So, who who was the? I didn't know who was the lady speaker. Jiro Kimmel. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't I don't remember names. No, that's okay. We heard her a few years ago. She's from Wisconsin. Okay. And when we seen her last on um, in Dorier, um, she had not done this yet, but just in the past three years, they have actually gone on the mission field. So she's been to a lot of different countries and she shared um, some of the things that they have gone through in yeah. countries where the gospel is not allowed to be preached. And just the blessing that we have to Amen. have an opportunity to hear it and uh, share it whenever we want. Amen. We have one here from Caleb Petu. He says, I'm thankful for saving you through the hurricane. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Caleb. Uh, and then we have, um, this is from Michelle. Praise for safety in the hurricane and good roommates to be sheltered in place with. And then she has the uh, emoji laughing until you're crying. So I'm sure they made some good memories in the midst of what was potentially a very dangerous situation. Anybody else from the church family? Brother Mike. Uh, praise for the uh, protection and safety on the road. Amen. Uh, How many hours on the road? 15 hours and 45. Yeah, that was a, a lot of driving, a lot of safety. Anybody else? You have a praise? Yes, Ruth. I'm thankful for God's grace and this beautiful weather that we've been having. It's the weather that my soul craves. Amen. This is great. This is great. Yes, Cheryl. I'm thankful for your girls because they were a huge blessing to a very good friend of mine who had a lot of damage in the yard at their house. I don't know if they had any damage to their house in the yard, mm -hmm. but the girls went over and helped. And good. And she called me as soon as she brought them back to campus. She called me and said, They were wonderful and they're so <laughs> well, those girls can all brush, let me tell you. They are, they are at home in their element when they're covered in ticks, all in brush. That's... <laughs> Anybody else? You have a phrase that you'd like to share? 
on this glorious Sunday evening. Anybody else? All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and take our hymn books. I'm going to have you turn to the second hymn, Wonderful Words of Life, 295. 295 wonderful words of life. Let's stand as we sing together. If you're able to join me, 295. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life teach me faith and beauty. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. On the second, Christ the blessed one gives to all, wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the love we call, wonderful words of life. Also freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. On the third, sweetly echo the gospel call. Wonderful words of life, offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life, Jesus only saved, saved from heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. The chorus is going to be 310, a few pages forward. 310, in my life, Lord, be glorified. And right now, as you kind of mill around, don't be bashful. Come on up here to the stage and at least give a wave. Say hi to the college students and others that are watching tonight. You are their church family and they miss you. Uh, I'm glad that you are participating and watching. We love you and we are praying for you. 310, in my life, Lord. Stay safe, miss you. Hi, girls, miss you. Can't wait to see you again. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, girls, we love you. Hello from paradise. <laughs> Okay. Say hi. Is it hi already? IPCC, love you guys, miss you all.
All right, I'm going to give uh, the team boys an opportunity to get up here because we're going to sing this together. I notice you're all making your way to the front door. What's that about? Come on up. Here we go. They're going to sing with me. Keep playing, Cheryl, because all these boys. Let me see. If you're in the youth ministry and you're a boy, uh, this is your opportunity to sing with your pastor. You can join us, Ethan. You know what? If anybody, even if you're younger than the youth ministry, come on up. Call the boys. Here we go. Go on. You guys join us? Yes. You got that tooth out, you'd be able to sing better. All right, here we go. We're going to sing. I'm sorry. I got you. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today in a second. In my song, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my song, Lord, be glorified today. In your church. In your church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In your church, Lord, be glorified today. Great singing. You may be seated. And I sure appreciate the help, guys. Uh, maybe we could do that again, huh? Maybe we could uh, we could work on a song together, and it would just be uh, Pastor and all of the young men of the church singing. I think that would be great. All in favor, raise your right hand. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. All right. That's how it's done in this church. <laughs> that is great. And I expect that maybe the ladies would want to do something similar. So my wife would be heading that up. <laughs> Mike, I'll need to come over and sleep at your house tonight. I, I think I just got kicked out. All right. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Joshua 23. Uh, if you've been with us on Sunday mornings, and this morning in particular, uh, we have been in the Gospel of John, John chapter 7. And specifically around John chapter 7, verse 17, there was the conditional clause of if. As far as doing the will to find out the substance, the integrity of the doctrine of what's being given. And this is going to be applied to false teachers as well as to Christ as the true teacher, capital T. And I gave you a quote, and I was referencing, as far as by paraphrase, Joshua 24, 15. And I have been going back to the book of Joshua, seeing how Joshua, first under the leadership of Moses, when Joshua was not yet the leader, and then Moses, my servant, is dead, chapter 1, and it comes into Joshua's charge. And in chapter 24, yes, there is that um, the dividing line of choosing. Uh, the light that you've been shown, what you know to be right. Are you going to obey? Will you serve? Will you follow? Or do you want to go back to the gods that are the false gods if it seemed evil to serve the Lord? But one chapter prior, I realized chapter 24, 15 is that verse that I paraphrased. Let me read it to you, give you the quote. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which... Your father served that were on the other side of the flood are the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, so we know that passage. Maybe you have it on a plaque on your wall somewhere in your office, a study. It's a great verse. It really is. It should highlight your declaration of consecration. That your life is not your own. You're not trying to do it your way. You want to do it God's way. You want to live for his glory. You know who you are in Christ. Your confidence is in arrogance. It's that you simply know whose you are. You understand you are the servant. Christ is your master. You are the bond servant. I never once, when I'm reading the New Testament, do I perceive of the Apostle Paul that it comes across as arrogance. Quite the contrast. It's his humility in Christ, but you would never be able to say that he was a wallflower. You would never say that he was a personality and a temperament that was easily swayed. Think of John the Baptist. What did you expect? A reed driven with the wind? Somebody that's just going to go whatever the doctrine is that's the prevailing wind of the day? 
It's not John the Baptist. He knew who he was. He knew his purpose. He even told his followers who were getting upset because some were dissenting in their mind and going after Christ. And he told them, this is, this is exactly what I told you was my purpose, that you would be followers of Jesus. I'm simply the forerunner. I'm simply the messenger, I'm not worthy to loosen the latchet on his shoe. It's Christ who must increase, I must decrease. Well, with this, we have the dynamic of what are you resisting? So in the morning message, I tried to stay true, just staying in John 7. But the tangent thought is this. It takes just as much power to resist the truth as it does to resist apostasy. It's your decision. There are those that they know what is right. They, they know what they're supposed to do. I've said for years now, it isn't so much a question of we're confused as to what to do. And that's why we didn't do it. It's that we know what to do, and we're choosing not to do it. We are resisting the truth. In John 7, 17, here was the conditional phrase, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Uh, recently, when I was with my family, we'd gone to visit my folks and, and my siblings and, and their kids all and their spouses came in uh, for a little get-together at my parents' house. And I don't know how many years it had been since I had taken the trip down to the Cuyahoga River where my brother and I had erected uh, the rope swing of all rope swings. And it truly was a sight to behold. It was even more exciting to ride. It went out over the Cuyahoga River, but it was built on the side of a cliff, really is what it was. And um, that makes your landing, uh, well, we didn't initially start jumping off into the water. That came later because of its shallowness. But it was mostly just to ride on. We had a friend who wanted to come with us, and, and we had told her, it was a, a girl that was a year younger than me, we had told her uh, we were jumping off into the Cuyahoga, but there was a very specific way in which you would do it so that you wouldn't get hurt, because you would find the bottom rather quickly. It was about four feet of water, but the depth uh, of what you were landing in per what you were letting go of was just, we were not using our brains at all we thought we were my brother had been crunching some numbers and ran the figures so he had me convinced and and i still remember his illustration it's like dropping a penny in the water eric when you drop a penny in the water it does this and gets to the bottom and so then it doesn't go straight down like a lead weight and so we had to do the penny maneuver uh, as our entry in well my friend didn't get that that memo and she ended up uh, opening up her knee in a way that was atrocious and we were on bicycles so we got the bike and got her on the bike and then uh, I could drive my brother could drive and we had to drive her to the hospital uh, it wasn't a good thing for her and she had to get it all cleaned out and she had all I think she took quite a bit of the uh, gravel and rock from the bottom of the Cuyahoga in her knee well my brother and I as we knew we were in serious trouble not maybe just with her parents but with our parents and and everybody else for that matter Brian was was making it clear that the problem the problem was that she didn't she she didn't commit fully in what we had said there was that tree forgot to mention it there was a tree <laughs> that was submerged in the water that was off the shoreline about 15 20 feet and you did have to swing out over the tree Otherwise, you were going to land on the tree. Once you were fully out, then you could let go. And so the problem with this, it wasn't on our thinking. It wasn't on us being stupid. It was on her. She didn't calculate her fall correctly. Had she done the penny maneuver, we wouldn't be in this mess. <laughs> Brian, I think we're going to have to own this one. I think, I think this is on us. We shouldn't have done that. But his angle was simply that of resisting. If she had just gone through with what we had said, we wouldn't have gone to Cog Falls General Hospital. We wouldn't have to drive our, our friend to get her knee stitched up and sutured. You know, there are times that we would say it wasn't about our resisting anything. That was, that was faulty planning from Eric and Brian all the way. I fully own that responsibility. And, and uh, thankfully, she didn't cast me off as a friend uh, in years following that. But there are times, though, where that point of what my brother had made it actually lines up with the reality of what's going on. It's our resistance. It's the fact that we didn't commit. 
We didn't go through with what we were supposed to go through with. Just like this morning, I gave the illustration of the Lord gives us the light to walk in, but we resist. Think of the question in Scripture. Do ye always resist the truth? You could say, well, you know, for the Pharisees, yes, they were resisting. What about for believers? What's it look like when we stop resisting the pull of apostasy, falling away from the truth? What's it like for a believer when they begin resisting the truth, when they're pushing it off? It's a life of conviction. It's a life of consequence. Scripture is complete in telling us that resisting sin is a good thing. James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom, verse 9, resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Scripture is also complete in telling us that resisting the Lord is a bad thing. We are to resist apostasy, sin, the temptation to fall away from that which we know is true, the mooring of our faith. But there is the scripture that tells us that resisting the Lord is wrong. Acts 7, 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, do ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Romans 13, 2, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. 2 Timothy 3, 8, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. That's where we were at on Wednesday night. Remember in our study in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that was the verse that I left off on. And I had told you that even though, according to uh, Talmudic writings, which are not inspired, but Jewish writings, they would say that these are the two names, Janus and Jambres, of the sorcerers that Pharaoh utilized. And that when they stood in front of Moses, they were trying to resist him through satanic power and trying to reproduce the very same things that he was doing that were miraculous by the power of God. Pulling out, stopping short, resisting. We know that there are consequences to this. Even in the area, as a child, I remember doing this. I'd go to the doctor, and my mom would take me in, and the doctor would say, okay, Eric, uh, i got to give you your booster shot for first grade or whatever it was. And I would resist. I would, I would tense up. No, 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 just relax. Just relax, Eric. Don't tense up. It's going to make it worse. We understand on a simple earthly level the area of resisting when it can be bad and then when it can be good. I remember the first time a person was trying to teach me how to shoot, and we'd gone out to a, uh, a shooting range. Actually, it was back in uh, our days as college students, uh, postgraduate really. And uh, we had a friend, he had all kinds of different guns, and he was letting us shoot those guns at, at this gun range that's not too far from the college. And we had some guns, and he was also doing the same shooting ours. But there was one in particular he'd said, he's like, okay, he's like, Eric, now for the recoil on this, don't try to resist. You're not going to be able to stop it. You won't be able to fight it. You're not stronger than the power of what's going on in the action of the gun. Work with it, but don't resist it. There are times that resisting is a bad thing. There's times that resisting is a good thing. Just matters what is it that's being resisted. In Joshua 23, I want you to notice, I'm going to read to you the first, well, let me just read you the chapter. Let me give you the context. I could just say, well, between verse 6 and verse 14, but let me just give you the full chapter. It's only 16 verses. I'll read it quickly. You can follow along silently. But I want you to know this is, if you will, the conditions leading into chapter 24. So choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you resist the truth? Will you continue to resist what God has shown you, or will you submit to it? Here's the context. And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. And ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. 
Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off, even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight, and ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. Verse 6. And you're going to have to think back in your mind to when it was Moses has passed away, and the Lord is then giving the exact same encouragement in chapter 1, verse 7, to Joshua. Here's what Joshua says in verse 6. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that ye come out among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and the strong, but as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves, that ye love the Lord your God. Notice verse 12. Else. I've underlined it in my Bible. You might do the same. Else, if ye do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them, and they to you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you. Notice this. And scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and ye know in all your heart and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring un upon you all evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you, when ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. Let's open in prayer. Father, I pray that you would guide us by your Spirit. I pray that if we learn only one lesson tonight, it is that we should be resisting the apostasy we should not be resisting the truth of your word. Christ was speaking to a group of individuals in John 7. Some were the residents of Jerusalem, maybe not the religious leadership, but they understood what was going on. They knew there was authority coming from Christ. There was the religious leadership. They understood his authority, but they wanted to have the authority, and so they sought to kill him. There were those that had come for the Feast of Tabernacles, and really they didn't understand fully what Christ was giving, but they were wanting to know more about the message that he gave. He was letting them know, he was letting us know, that if we will simply do the will of the one who is doing the teaching, we will quickly find out if it is in fact from God. Lord, I know that as we follow you, as we follow your word, as we don't resist, we find that it is the life that is blessed. We not only then have peace with God, but then we can understand the peace of God. I pray as believers that we wouldn't have folks in our midst this evening that are resisting, pushing against, bucking the authority that you have in their life. I pray that they would understand it's not about living life their way, but living life God's way. Father, we ask that you would encourage us through these lessons and even this tangent truth from the morning message may be able to help us be conformed more to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in Christ's name I ask. Amen. I've titled this Resisting the Truth or Resisting Apostasy. So I've made my case that, yes, resisting isn't always bad, but it's not always good. It depends on what is being fought, what is being resisted. In John chapter 8, verse 12, looking ahead, I found some verses all dealing with Christ as the light, the one who is giving the illumination. John chapter 8, verse 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Remember the illustration I gave was simply walking as the Lord gives light. Stop complicating it. Stop implying that you have to know how to get to the far side of the moon with a map that's written in hieroglyphics. That's not Christianity. That's not the Christian life. It's simply one day at a time. 
And if that's too much to think about, because you're not guaranteed the next 24 hours, think of it moment by moment that you're kept in his care. Day by day, you are in the Lord's will. And as he illuminates the path, you simply are obedient in walking in it. You're not resisting the truth. What we are to resist, though, Satan, apostasy, the falling away, and the things of this world that hold so tightly as we're looking in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I was challenging the young people in particular, considering the, the uh, malleable state of youth, and that many times they would say, well, you know what, I was young, I was immature, and I got, I got in with the wrong crowd. And on Wednesday night, I was trying to formulate, okay, look at this list. Look at a, a group of individuals that they are lovers more of pleasure than of God. They are ungrateful. They're unthankful. They're disobedient to parents. The temporal things of this world have caught their gaze. The eternal things, that has no bearing on their life. Run from them. I was saying the two points on Wednesday night, didn't even get to finish the second one. Instead of doing it just run from the false, the world, the whole second part of 2 Timothy 3 is run to the word. So as your pastor, I'm saying, yes, you can use an alliterated outline, but it's a very simple truth. You are to run from the rudiments, the philosophy of the world. I'm a believer and I live in this world. I'm in this world, but I don't have to be of this world. It doesn't have to have tentacles around me that everything the world then embraces and does I embrace and I do what they laugh at. I laugh at what they watch. I watch what they are doing in their habits. Those become my habits. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. I can be a light. I can walk in light as the Lord illuminates the path going on in the gospel of John, John eleven ten. 10. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there's no light in him. All right, we've all done this. And parents who have small kids, you know that it's the diciest thing in the world to walk through a child's bedroom at night with no light. You're going to hit that one Lego on the floor or, you know, the jacks that were out. You didn't see it. Or maybe it's the skateboard that should have been put away. All right. You don't have the light. And so then your way is is fraught with danger. Yeah. John 12, 35. Then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. I realize this is also time sensitive for however long we're on this earth, outside of eternity. However, it's also relational to a person's walk in Christ. As you've been given that light, walk in it. Maybe like me, you at one point had something that was glow in the dark and you really liked it. I had a couple of things when I was little that were glow in the dark. But, you know, if we're going back to 1981. You remember how glow in the dark worked, at least back then. What'd you have to do? What'd you have to do with your glow in the dark bouncy ball? What'd you have to do with it? Hold it to a light. You had to hold it to a light. And then did it just forever stay at that luminosity? No. It, it would start to fade. Why? What'd you have to do? You had to get it back to the light. I realize that is a simple, childish illustration. But the light that God has given me today will not be sufficient 10 years from now. If I do nothing in going back to the light, there are those that are now debating in theological circles, why do we have devotions? And as a five-year-old mind, I can raise my hand and say, uh, to get closer to the light, because you're fading. You're trying to utilize what you learned 10 years ago. You've been away from the word. You've been away from God's will. And you expect to have that same luminosity. You're not. You need to go back to the light. And then you can radiate for a time what it is that you've taken in. Why is the dead sea dead? Because it has an inlet but no outlet. In the same way that as believers, God's created us. And in Sunday school, we talked about the area of gifts. We aren't then just to say, okay, I'm going to take pastor's admonition. I'm going to spend all day long reading the Bible and singing hymns and praying. And there's never an outlet of service. There's never an outlet of ministering to others or caring for people or your neighbors or the world or those that don't know Christ. Friends, just like the Dead Sea, you're going to start to stink. It's going to be dead because you took in and took in and took in. And you never were allowing it to come out of you. 
We shouldn't be resisting the light. We should gravitate towards it. But it's not for our own betterment only. It's for the body. It's for the church. It's for those around us. It's for those who look to you as an example of what a believer is. Paul was telling Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example of the believers. And then he gives all of those areas that follow. It's been 20 years since the children of Israel entered the land of Canaan, the promised land. Joshua says he's old, he's nearing death. He fears the children of Israel will never drive out the enemies like they were supposed to do. He warns them of apostasy, falling away from truth. You know, his remarks are quite similar to what Paul gave on the shores at Ephesus in Acts 20, 28 through 31. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. I'd like to tell you that there has never been an occasion where I started to get the hackles on the back of my neck to stand up because I feared that there was a wolf coming into the congregation. I wish I could say that had never happened. As a matter of fact, not too distant memory, there was an individual and we were chatting at length about this very passage. And right from the get-go, it was clear that some of the things that were being espoused by him were not biblical. And he wanted to ask what I believed in this area and this area and this area. And what I thought was going to be a five-minute kind of an introductory conversation quickly turned into almost a 45-minute hour conversation. And then he made a statement. He had said, you know, some pastors have a hard time, you know, if uh, I were to come into a church or if people come in their church, you know, because they're dealing with an ego and they're afraid if they're talking or whispering to other people that it's going to lead them astray. And I had said, well, I don't know that that's because of their insecurity, which is what he had termed. I said, I think it's because they care for the flock. I don't think that Paul was insecure. I think Paul was absolutely aware of what would happen as the grievous wolves would come in and not spare the flock. It wasn't that he was saying as a spiritual leader, an elder to them, one who had invested three years, night and day, praying for their souls. He wasn't saying it's because of my ego and my reputation and I'm insecure as a person. Therefore, I don't want you to talk to other people. No, he, he wasn't saying that at all. He was simply saying, I know that there will come false teachers. There's going to come people that will try to subvert and lead away. Joshua had the same concern. Joshua is saying to them, everything that's happened so far, this wasn't because you're really great, because you're really strong. Do you realize that all the enemies that you've defeated, um, it wasn't you. It was God. God fought for you. I'm going to give you two points quickly. I'm going to focus on the negative one first. It's really the results of apostasy. You just saw this. We just read it together. What happens when we don't resist apostasy? What happens when we don't resist the false teachers? What happens when we don't resist those who have some new and improved methodology that leaves the Bible collecting dust on the sidelines, but you're supposed to follow their mantra very, very closely? What happens when we don't resist that? First of all, you find defeat in Joshua 23, 13, part A. He says, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations before, from before you. Uh, verse 3 tells us, the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. So we find defeat. We find quickly, much like Samson, who rose up having had his head shaved. He went out not knowing that the Spirit of God was departed from him. He was going to go do it like he's always done it in the past, and he didn't even know God's not fighting your battle anymore. God's not on your side. You're no longer singing the hymn, who is on the Lord's side, and you don't even realize that God is going to allow you to find failure and defeat because you did not resist apostasy. Victory was theirs as long as verse 3 was true. When God pulls out of your camp, there is only one option. 
defeat. Secondly, notice the discomfort. Chapter 23, verse 13, part B. But they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. I think the word discomfort is rather mild when you consider what's being stressed. And think on that for a moment, not because I'm trying to be unduly graphic, but the Lord is the one that gave the picture. Failure to press on to full accomplishment is terribly discomforting. I've used the illustration numerous times because I watched it, not live, as if I was there. I wasn't in Barcelona in 1992, but I was watching the Olympics in 1992. You might remember Derek Redmond. Um, He was the uh, uh, British Olympian running the Open 400. He tore his hamstring about three quarters of the way through the race. His dad came over the sideline. The guards tried to stop his dad. And then his dad put his arm around him and kind of lifted him up. And and Derek would not leave the track. He stayed in his lane. He knew he wasn't he wasn't going to technically be able to place. That was completely without question. He just wanted to finish. And his dad helped him and he was crying. Derek was in absolute agony. His dad was crying. You can watch it. It's you can go to YouTube. Derek Redmond, 400, 1992 Olympics. It's powerful. Interviewers asked him, why, why run? You pushed away medical staff. You literally, you didn't pull your hamstring. You didn't tear it, strain it slightly. He tore his hamstring. I mean, welcome to surgery. Never went on to really do anything with running beyond 1992. That was, for the most part, the end of everything that he had. To him, though, not finishing was a worse fate than having to finish with a torn hamstring. If only as Christians, we had an inkling of that. Instead of saying, well, you know what? It's, uh, it's, it's suffering, it's trial, there's sorrow. If I, if I keep stepping in the light, as Christ is the light, as I keep following the illuminated path, I'm bound to have tears flow. Well, the servant's not greater than the master. My savior was crucified. He's called me not to a life of ease, but one of service and consecration. Folks, there is a worse fate than sorrow, tragedy, trial, and tears. You know what it is? When we stop resisting apostasy. When we give in and Satan's MO starts to line up and we become affiliated with those who at one time were there and now we're not. Like Demas. He's forsaken me, Paul says, having loved this present world. We don't know what it was. Many have said, was it the allurement? Was it the materialism? Did he did he consider himself deprived because he didn't have the other things and he felt that he deserved that? I don't know. And it would be wrong to import that into scripture and say that this is what it was. Bottom line, when choosing, uh, do I follow Christ or do I go my own way? I'll, I'll go my own way. I'm just, I want to be able to at least have some say in what I do, where I go. I want to make choices. I want to be able to, you know, stand up and and say that I did it my way. We saw the futility of those words from this morning. It's not my way that we should want, that I should want. It's God's way. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. Psalm 37. We find defeat, we find discomfort as we fail to resist the apostasy. The pampered sin is now a full-blown pain in the side and a thorn in the eye. Look at that picture again. It's a thorn in the eye. The compromising Christian is not a happy, comfortable person. They're tormented. The third area that I see is disgrace. There's defeat, there's discomfort. In verse 16, there's disgrace. It says, when ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land, which he hath given unto you. Perish quickly. It means to wander away. It's the definition of apostasy. To willingly, volitionally wander away from what you knew to be true. To lose oneself. To fail to lose. 
I've told my children regarding their academics, getting a C or below is not a disgrace unless you could have done better and you chose not to. There's no disgrace getting lost in the woods unless you knew the path directly in front of you and you chose to walk off the face of the cliff. The disgrace spiritually stems from not failing, but from the refusal to claim the victory when it was yours to claim. That's where the disgrace comes. The disgrace doesn't come when we say, I'm, I'm scared. I'm not supposed to have the spirit of fear, but when I look ahead, I don't know about the unknown, and, it, and I'm kind of battling being scared. Okay, we all face that because we're human. That isn't the disgrace. It wasn't that Elijah was facing disgrace because he was fearful of Jezebel's proclamation that his head would be severed from his body 24 hours hence. That wasn't the disgrace. The disgrace was, why did you run away and go hide in the midst of the cave? The Lord asked him, what are you doing here? When the Lord asks us, um, why are you here? Much like a parent asking a child, why are you up? Why are you out of bed? What are you doing? Are, are, are you not knowing where you're supposed to be? Are you confused on this? The disgrace was that he was more willing to hear the sounds of the words coming out of the mouth of an apostate like Jezebel than he was in simply listening to the still small voice that God had said is the God of all comfort. He would take care of him. He uses a brook. He uses ravens to bring food. He tells them sleep, eat, sleep some more. Eat some more. Elijah didn't have to run. He chose to run. Then you think about Gehazi. Oh, that would be the servant of Elisha. And he ran in such a way that it was towards that which was wrong. Remember Naaman, captain of the Syrian host? He has leprosy. He goes. He wants to be cleansed. Instead of dunking in the rivers back home, he's going to dunk in the Jordan and it's filthy. And why do I have to do this? In the midst of that, he's cleansed of his leprosy by faith. He offers the goods and the garments and the silver. The prophet of God, the man of God says no, but the servant says yes. And he runs out and follows and says, regarding that, let's go ahead and um, work out an arrangement. You know, it's for the prophets, the school of prophets and others that can be serving the Lord and considering ministry, his opportunity for gain. He goes back, the Lord knew. The servant of God knew the very same leprosy that left Naaman is now going to cling to you. We can run from apostasy or we can run to it. It's our choice. A life of unfaithfulness while breathing is a mockery to God's grace. Let me give that to you again. A life of unfaithfulness while we are breathing is a mockery to God's grace. We are then a disgrace. We are discomforted. We are in defeat, even though as believers, we are already victorious. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. And yet at times when we follow after the false teaching, when we refuse to step in the light as Christ is the light, we find ourselves having these very same effects. On the positive, what happens when we resist apostasy? Chapter 23 in Joshua, verse 6. Be therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside from the right hand or to the left. Remember again, it's the same admonition given in chapter 1, verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. They're almost identical. It's the same charge. The one who is on the receiving end is now on the end of giving the command and saying, hey, um, I have learned some things. And I know that God can be trusted. And I know that as our enemies have been defeated, you might be thinking it's you or that you're really good warriors. It's not. Because of verse 3, we know that it's God who has done the fighting for us. And instead of giving in to our thinking and following after apostasy or false doctrine, false teaching, or giving up on the roots of Christianity because we refuse to walk in the light. And the illumination that we once had when we once were close to Christ, it's now faded. And we're starting to question if, in fact, it even works. I referenced the individual who had said, and again, I'm not saying they were even saved. They made the statement that they were saved and they know Christ and they used all the language. That was his words. Used all the language. Well, using all the language of a Christian doesn't make you saved. 
being in church doesn't make you saved. He went to a seminary that doesn't make you saved. You were doing the work of the Lord and you traveled abroad to do the work of the Lord that doesn't make you saved. He felt that by doing all of these things, it would then validate who he was, that he would be esteemed more spiritual, that he would be viewed more spiritual, like those he saw around him. And I believe in that interlude, in that time frame, this individual just got further and further from the word of God. In the midst of their confusion, instead of taking time to go back to the word, Lord, help me to understand this. Help me to understand your doctrine. As you're leading, I'm stepping. Show me more. Teach me more about this. Help me to see plainly what right now seems to be cloudy. I don't understand. Is there an area that I'm resisting? Is there an area that I'm not obeying? Reveal it to me. It's why we have special meetings. It's why we have invitations to say, Lord, I want to keep a short list. I don't want it to get long and drawn out that somehow I'm living apart from your grace. The disgrace spiritually leads then to the area of the positive. When we resist apostasy, it's first marked by obedience. Our spiritual talk is put to the test according to John 7, 17. If any man will do his will. We don't wait to obey until we know it all. Obedience is the first step. Further revelation and wisdom will follow. Obedience doesn't follow Obedience precedes. I know that years ago, we, we actually, in our most recent visit with family, had taken the kids uh, back to the cemetery that I had worked. And they were asking me various stories of, you know, when you were with Uncle Brian working here. And there was one that was a favorite of mine. And uh, it was, my brother was on a Kubota tractor. It was a good-sized Kubota. And, and uh, it had all kinds of gears. Uh, it, and it could go pretty fast for a tractor. And it had a large dump trailer on the back that was kind of unsteady. It was wildly because it could dump left and right. It was just a pin that held it in. And it was full of asphalt that day. We were filling in potholes on the roads throughout the cemetery. And, and we were at the top of this super steep hill. And uh, my brother was driving. I was on the trailer, which was pretty typical. Uh, he, he wore the hat, so he was in charge. And I was hanging on the trailer. And all I hear at the last moment as we're like going over the curve is Brian's statement of I know a shortcut. Well I should have I should have abandoned the trailer at that point. But you know what I did? I made a decision. I made a decision to hang on. I'm gonna hang on to the trailer and I'm just gonna ride this down into a blaze of glory. Now we narrowly missed a couple of trees at the bottom of this. The tractor was sideways. We didn't roll it thankfully. Uh, we did have some serious damage uh, to the grass and the turf, and we found ourselves receding and destroying that later on. But of the many stories with Brian, asking myself, why would you, why would you stay? Why wouldn't you resist? Well, I can, I can tell you that it's because I trusted him. He said, well, why didn't, why did you trust him? He's failed so many times. Well, I love my brother, and, and I trust him. You love the Lord. He's never failed you. So when he says follow me, will you follow? Will you stay on? You're going to hang on the proverbial trailer of life? I'm not saying it isn't scary or daunting. I'm just saying it's, it is trust. It is faith that allows us to hang on when everything else screams, you need to jettison this. You need to let go of this. If you let go now, problems, suffering, trials, affliction, It'll all go by the wayside. And I will tell you that I think there are those that after having spent time in church, away from the word, remember, in church, away from the word, there is that temptation from Satan that simply says this, it's time to jettison. It's time to let go. It's time to cut your losses. You've been going through this for how long? Hanging on, trusting when it's not really there. I don't think that it's a moment decision at that point. I think that there were trust issues that go way back with that individual. In my case, with a silly illustration, I continue to exhibit trust in my brother when I probably shouldn't have. Sadly, there are people that are not exhibiting trust in Christ when they should. There were those that Christ was speaking to that said he was a deceiver. Some said he's a good man, he's moral. He simply was saying that my teaching is not that of my own. It's from God. He'd come down from heaven. They didn't like his claim to being the Messiah. 
Clearly then, they're not going to like his claim that his teaching is not his own. His judgment is not his own. His works were not his own. We saw that in John 5. Resisting apostasy is first seen in the area of obedience, secondly in the area of separation. Look at verse 7 and 8. It says that ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. This is transparently clear of the worldliness around. It's understanding that you don't have to be well-versed in all things sinful to be a good servant of the Lord. Quite the opposite is true. It would be better that we were simple concerning that which is evil and wise concerning that which is good. Let us be ignorant regarding the things of this world. All of the tentacles of sin, you don't need to know about it. All of the filth of the music industry and Hollywood and all of what is considered the latest and the greatest. We don't have to know those things. What we do need to know, and it should be a part of our lives, is right here found in the word of God. The third area is devotion. It goes hand in hand with that second point, that of separation. Verse 11 says, take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that ye you love the Lord your God. You could summarize not only the commandment, the greatest commandment that we are to follow of loving the Lord our God with all that we are, heart, mind, body, and soul, and spirit. But specifically, think of this in the application regarding human relationship, thinking of marriage. It says, if ye love me, ye will keep my commandments. The devotion is not a mere cause, it's to Christ. This is you each day putting your love for Christ into action. Truly love him, and you'll only be content with possessing all of him. Like a spouse. You're not sharing your spouse. You'll seek a spouse whose love is consistent in loving him as well. You'll seek to raise your children so that they love him also. You will find love for all who truly love him. A couple of quotes here for you. Our love for Christ should be to the extent that people will have to go through him to get to us. Again, our love for Christ should be to the extent that people would have to go through him to get to us. Sadly, for many believers, their lives force people to trip over them and their pursuit of Christ. Folks, the test of love is not feeling or speaking. It's obeying. And John 14, 21, in conclusion, says this. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. So instead of merely professing our love for the Lord, when we take his doctrine, when we take his teaching, when we consume that, and it becomes a part of us, and we simply, in faith, follow him, obey him, it shows then our love for our Lord. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for this time together. And as we've seen from this morning, as well as this evening, there is a choice each day that we must make. We could take Joshua 24, 15, put it on a plaque, put it up on our wall, be able to quote it, to see it, to share it with others, to agree with it wholeheartedly. But each day we have an opportunity whether we will resist the truth of your teaching, of your word, or whether or not we will resist apostasy, the falling away from truth. Lord, I know that through the years there have been folks that have joined us, been a part of this ministry, that are no longer a part of this ministry, that are not walking in your will, that are not walking according to your word. There may have been a time that they were close to the illumination that your word gave, and they shone brightly, but it's diminished, it's, it's dim now. I pray that we would see this, not so that we can look down our noses condescendingly towards them, but that we might consider ourselves. I realize that we're here tonight. I'm speaking to the, the faithful crowd. I know we also have faithful members who are not able to join us that are watching right now. Maybe some who are sick, some from a bed, some that are infirmed and, and just dealing with health issues right now, but they are absolutely devoted and committed and in your service just as much as those who are here. Lord, I do pray for those who have gone astray. 
I pray for those who have wandered, who have started to entertain the teaching, the false teaching of the world, and they've resisted the truth of your word. I pray that you give them eyes of understanding. May they see from us, instead of critical spirits, may they see a heart of love, that we want to warn them in the same way that Paul wanted to warn the church at Ephesus, that Joshua wanted to warn the Israelites. May they love the Lord their God with all of their hearts. May they stay true to him. May they not intermingle themselves with those in the world in such a way that it becomes a, a stronghold and pulls them from that place of mourning. No, they can't lose their salvation, but they can absolutely lose that place of fellowship. So I pray that tonight you would just encourage our hearts, convict our hearts, and maybe there are those that want to take some time and just pray for loved ones who are moving away from the word rather than getting closer to the word. Lord, we ask that you would bring them back. We ask that by your grace, they would again be able to see the truth that once they claim, once they knew, and if they're not saved, Lord, we pray that they might be saved soon, that they would humble themselves, relinquish their pride, and come to find salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name I ask this. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn to six.